to my extreme. Okay, try that again. Welcome everybody to this week's uh, risk seminar. As you probably heard, this recording is uh, this session is being recorded, and it's my extreme uh, pleasure to introduce a Cal alum, Ricardo Fernholtz, who's now a professor at Claremont McKenna College, talking about the university of universality of Zip's law. So, Rick, I'll hand off to you and look forward Thank to listening. You. Yeah, thanks so much for the intro. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming out. It's, it's very nice to be uh, back at Berkeley, even if it is in this virtual format. Um, uh, so please feel free to you know, ask questions, interrupt. I, I will keep my eye on, on hands. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to pause you know, regularly, but if I don't see a hand or you have a comment, just, just feel free to interrupt and chime in. I think it makes the talk better for everybody. So. Um, so Zipp's law, the uh, the original version of it came from uh, from language. Actually, if, if you look at the frequency of a word in written language, some collection of written language, um, you'll find that it is inversely proportional to its rank. So the number one most common word, it's probably and or something like this, is twice as common as the number two ranked, and it's three times as common as number three, and four times as common as number four, and so on. Uh, and this comes from uh, George Zipf, a linguist, such as how Zipf's law got its name. And um, so the one way of visualizing Zipf's law is to do a, a log log plot of the frequency of words versus rank. Uh, and so uh, it's, this is a nice way to see Zipf's law is because if you get a slope, a straight line with a slope of minus one in this type of plot, that tells you that you have Zipf's law. Uh, and here we look at word counts from Wikipedia and you know, more than 30 different languages. And you can see that all of them are basically straight lines with slopes of minus one. So Zipp's law is not just in English, but it's in many different languages. And it's not just in, you know, literary works, but it's also, if you look at Wikipedia, um, we will look at these types of plots sort of uh, repeatedly in this talk. Um, frequently I'll have the, the size, I'll talk about the size of cities, another classic example of Zipp's law, the size of firms on the uh, y-axis, and then we'll have the rank on the x-axis. But this is a common way to visualize Zipp's law because you can just look, you see a straight line with slope minus one, you know that you have Zipp's law. Uh, and also more generally, a Pareto distribution or a power law can be visualized this way. If you look at this type of log log plot of size versus rank, if you get a straight line, then you have a power law or a, a Pareto distribution, same thing. So Zipp's law, of course, is a very, very special case of a power law, right? There's, you know, you can have a straight line with lots of different slopes. To have it be exactly minus one is a pretty striking special case, uh, yet that's exactly what we observe here for words and to some extent what we observe at least for some city size distributions and also uh, firm size at least measured by employees. Um, so one of the things I'm going to argue today uh, based on some past work is that there's also sort of a, a weaker form of Zipp's law that's not that you get a straight line log log plot like we will sort of see here. Um, but instead, you can get a concave curve when you plot size versus rank, uh, and you're going to have a tangent of minus one somewhere. So I'm going to argue that this is a weaker form of Zipp's law, and it's a very closely related phenomena. And to be a little provocative early in the talk, uh, if we go back and look at the sort of classic Zipp's law with, with word frequency, um, if you look closely at some of these lines, you can see that they're not completely straight, right? You see a little bit of curvature. I mean, it's sort of hard to tell because there's so many of them. But you, you kind of see here, especially in the middle, you start to see a little bit of curvature. So you could even argue that the classic Zipp's law for language, where Zipp got its name, uh, is really maybe just a weaker form of Zipp's law where it's actually a concave plot with a tangent of minus one. Um, so I'm going to argue that these two things are essentially, they're very closely related. And I'll, I'll make all this precise with some theory. And, and, and uh, I'll show you some examples as well. Um, so. Uh, to give you a sense, I mean, we've, we've probably, most of us have heard uh, power laws, Pareto distributions, and, and many different applications. Uh, there's a really nice survey here from a, a physicist, Newman, I think he's at Michigan, uh, from 2006. So I've, I've literally taken these plots straight out of his paper. I don't have the raw data. Um, but it's nice to see how common they are. Um, so one thing I, I don't want people to get thrown off, these plots are actually reversed from the way that I, I just showed it and from what I'll do throughout the talk. The rank is actually now on the y-axis. The frequency of words in the case of panel A is on the x-axis. 
Um, the, the size observations, frequency observations are on the x-axis. So these are reverse. Uh, please just be aware of that. I don't want people to get confused. Um, so in the top left, we see uh, the classic Zipf's law for language, uh, line of slope minus one. Uh, and panel B is the citations of scientific papers. I think it's papers from like 1985, and then it's citations, you know, in a 10 or 15 year period afterwards. So it's cumulative citations. And you can see uh, a power law in the sort of upper tail of the distribution, which is very common for these Pareto distributions. Uh, um, we have unique website visits uh, on a given day uh, in panel C. We have cumulative book sales over a period, I think, of almost two centuries, 200 years in panel D. Uh, we have telephone calls received on, on a given day in panel E. We have the magnitude of earthquakes in California over a period of 70, 80 years in panel F. So all of these are examples of power laws, not necessarily Zipf's law, but just power laws, Pareto distributions. Um, in panel G, we have the crater of, um, of moon craters, uh, the diameter. Uh, on H, we have the intensity of solar flares over uh, a decade. Um, in I, we have the intensity of wars measured by um, per capita casualties. This is over a period of almost 200 years. Um, panel J, we have uh, the Forbes 400 data on net worth of, of households in the US, top 400. So this is a, a one year uh, observation. Panel K is the frequency of last names from census data also in a, in a given census year. Uh, and then panel L, a uh, classic example of a power law and also Zips law in many cases is um, the size of cities using census data in the US. Um, so all of these are examples of power laws, not necessarily Zips law, but uh, Pareto distributions. Um, so one thing we'll notice here is um, power laws are, they're ubiquitous, right? We, we see them in a lot of different applications. I mean, we're talking about geology with moon craters and, and earthquakes. We're talking about economics with wealth distribution, demography with city size, linguistics with word frequency. Um, so one of the things that motivated uh, at least the first part of what I'm going to present today is, um, uh, is this observation. And then this is a quote by Terry Tao, well-known mathematician at UCLA, where he says, there isn't a satisfactory and convincing explanation for Zipf's law, uh, for Zipf's law. So, uh, and especially it's universality. Um, so one thing that's going to be really important, I, I want to spend a couple of minutes on here at the, the intro to, before I get into the theory, is um, because Zipf's law is universal, right? We, we see it in economics, um, but we also see it in demography. Uh, we also see it in linguistics with the, uh, the languages. Uh, and that's, that's you know, the original motivation. Uh, because it is, um, you know, uh, universal in this way, you, you don't want to have a field specific explanation. It doesn't make sense to have an economic model that explains its law for firm size, a demographic model that explains it for city size, and then a linguistic model that explains it for language and word frequency. Um, and then they're all just by coincidence, you get the same distribution in three different fields with three completely different mechanisms and three completely different models. Uh, I am intentionally going to lay out a mathematical statistical theory that is, uh, that is general, that is, is not going to be based on an economic model of equilibrium or optimization. It can be consistent with an economic model, but it will not be based on one. Uh, and this is done very, you know, this is done very intentionally. Uh, it, it would not be appropriate to uh, approach a question like this in that way. And I think Terry Tao's quote uh, goes in that direction. And, you know, the, the um, I don't know if it's the, the best metaphor, the best example, but a, a, um, another way of thinking about this is take something like the, um, the central limit theorem, which is another form of, of universality that we've all seen. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense to have like a biology explanation of the central limit theorem in biology and then a physics one of the central limit theorem and, and physics. I mean, we all know that the central limit theorem is this form of universality because we've all taken econometrics and statistics and we've seen the proof of it. Um, I'm going to take the same approach to explaining Zipf's law, since it's also a form of universality. Um, I will, of course, now, I'm an economist, uh, and so I'm going to leave some time at the end for, I'm gonna get into applications of the theory I lay out to economics and finance, so there, there are a number of those, but the basic theory is going to be mathematical and statistical. Okay, so what are we going to find? Well, one of the, I think, novel conclusions that's gonna emerge from this theory is there's sort of a dichotomy between um, sort of Zipfian Pareto distributions 
in non Ziphian Pareto distributions and the types of mechanisms, data generating processes that give rise to them. So things like firm size, city size, word frequency, uh, even income and wealth of households, which will follow sort of the weaker form of, of the quasi Ziphian distribution, as I'll call it. Um, these are systems of data generated by time dependent uh, rank, they're time dependent and rank based. So that means that you have these processes sort of evolving, uh, you know, sort of randomly, and it's kind of rank based and you have changes in rank and you always have some sort of randomness driving changes and the system is evolving. It's also sta stationary, right? There's a distribution that's approximately stable, but there's an evolution of the processes and the ranks are changing over time. Um, this will be in contrast to sort of non Zipfian Prado distributions, which tend to be generated by other mechanisms. So earthquake magnitude, not a time dependent rank based system in, in the sense that I described. Um, an earthquake happens one year, then it ends, and then it's just an observation. And then you, you know, wait a few more years and there's another earthquake. And then after 200 years, you take all the earthquakes in California and you rank them and you get a Pareto distribution. Um, that is a fundamentally different process, a fundamentally different phenomena. And, you know, there's no reason to expect that this will come out in some type of Zipfian distribution, whether the weak form of Zip's law or the strict form of Zip's law. The, the results I present will have nothing to say about these types of systems. They will have a lot to say about the time dependent rank based systems. And in particular, what I'm going to show uh, is a paper of, of, of mine from about, about a year ago that um, if these systems follow Gibraltar's law, so Gibraltar's law means equal growth rates and equal volatilities at all ranks in the distribution, then if you cover enough ranks, you have to cover enough of the system, and I'll make all of this very precise in a few minutes, then uh, you should get Zip's law. Uh, and I'll generalize that to the weaker form of Zip's law as well. Um, that will be the result, again, only appropriate for systems of data that are time dependent and rank based. Uh, and one thing to say, you know, a little, um, Shout out to the, the economics literature that, that first looked at Zipsol, starting with uh, Gabase's important paper in 1999 from the QJE. Um, this result, this explanation of Zipsol for these types of systems is going to not de depend on specific details of a model, right? That this is important. Economists pointed this out in, in, in various uh, attempts to shed light on, on Zipsol. Uh, it should not be, you know, specific details of a model should not be driving this result because it's universal. Uh, and that's really important. It's something that uh, I believe is consistent with the, the results I'm going to show you. Um, okay, so uh, let me say, as I said, I, I'm going to make a point, even if I have to skip some, some of the technical things, to, to leave some time for applications. Uh, I'm an economist. I like economic uh, applications. I like finance applications, and there are a number uh, of them with this theory that I think are, are really interesting. Um, one of the things I will talk about for, for a number of reasons is the distribution of U.S. firm sizes, at least measured by market capitalization, so market firm size, so publicly traded U.S. stocks. Um, there are a couple of reasons why this is an interesting example. Um, first of all, it's going to follow what uh, I call the, the sort of weaker form of ZIPs, the, the quasi Zipfian distribution. Um, and also, it's going to, uh, I'm going to show you with some empirical estimates that it aligns very nicely. So, this system, if you estimate the growth rates and volatilities at different ranks, it aligns very, very closely with the assumptions of, of one of the theorems I'll, I'll show you. Uh, and then also, you know, hopefully, as we would expect, it also aligns very nicely with the predictions of the theorem. So it's a nice way of sort of demonstrating the kind of weaker form of Zipf's law using the theory I laid out. Uh, but there's an added bonus to looking at this example. Uh, this is more provocative, just something I've, I've been thinking out more recently. If you look at that distribution, again, of, of market firm sizes measured, measured by market cap, um, Post 2020, so post pandemic, I'll look at some data from, from December 2020, but you know, same thing is in 2021, just couldn't get the curse data yet. Um, you will see a pretty clear deviation from, from the quasi Zipfian weaker version of Zip's law with this concave plot with a tangent of minus one. I'll, I'll show you some pictures, it's pretty striking. Um, and this is a potential sign that there's sort of a change in kind of the underlying stochastic dynamics of, of, this, of these you know, stock growths. Um, so one of the things uh, I'll get into is you can extend the framework, the basic framework that, that I'll lay out to, to explain Zip's law, 
is essentially a rank-based system where uh, it's, an, it's an ergodic model, right? All of the processes are ex ante the same. It's, it's kind of like a random growth model in economics, which are you know, common in a number of applications. But all of the processes are ex ante the same. You take T to infinity, everybody's the same. Um, there are now extended versions, you know, uh, richer models now where you can have uh, a persistent permanent heterogeneity, non-ergodic model. So they're name-based or index-based parameters. Uh, and this means that now certain processes will always be different from certain other processes. Um, this would be one potential explanation of the deviations that we're seeing from the quasi zipfian distribution of the, uh, of the market caps, uh, firm sizes post uh, uh, pandemic, post 2020. I, I don't have proof of this. I'm just gonna show you the picture. It's just an idea. Um, I will talk about city size distributions. There's some, some fascinating papers. Um, first showing that there, there's some clear deviations from Zips law and power laws where you see a really large um, capital city or top two cities are just much bigger than would be predicted from the classic uh, Zipfian or even just power law distribution. Uh, that can be explained by these non-ergodic models with the, the rank and name-based parameters. Um, there's also, I think, even more interesting and, and more subtle, there's this nice paper by Davis and Weinstein, I think it's from the AER in 2002, and they, they argue against random growth models of uh, city size and, and economics by showing that if you look at Japan, uh, you know, the city size distribution pre-World War II, and then there were obviously heavy bombings in World War II, a lot of destruction, city sizes were, were massively reduced. And then you look at the distribution after that happened, the biggest cities before the bombings become the biggest cities after, which is inconsistent, or at least it's a striking coincidence, basically inconsistent with a model that is ergodic, where all of the things that were just rank based, where everything is just the same ex ante. Uh, and it hints strongly at some type of locational fundamentals, right? There's something fundamentally different about the growth dynamics of Tokyo versus some small town in the middle of, of, of nowhere. Um, so Again, strong evidence that there's more going on than just the rank-based framework. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about uh, you know, some of my work on, on wealth distribution and long-run mobility, where you, again, observe certain things about very long-run mobility that would be inconsistent with uh, a purely rank-based uh, random growth model. Um, so I'll make a point of saving time to, to get into these applications because uh, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's uh, important for all of us. Um, so let me pause for a second make sure there are no questions. Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, Rick, good, good to see you again. Um, yeah, good to see you. So if we think about the Japan example, well, clearly there was massive destruction of uh, both productive capacity and housing. Uh, but did the people, you know, move to rural areas and then move back into cities or did they stay in the heavily damaged cities, in which case uh, it's not really starting over. It's, uh, you know, sort of people rebuilding where they are in place. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I I am not I haven't read the the Davis and Weinstein deeply because this is just an idea. But my understanding is there were, there were heavy casualties. I, I think a lot of people got killed. Now, was it enough to make you know Tokyo uh, and other cities you know not be the biggest cities anymore? I I, I feel like the answer would be yes just given that the authors published this paper and, and, it's, and it's gotten so much attention and it's considered strong evidence against kind of the random growth hypothesis, but I, I'm not positive. I, I have not, uh, I, I'm not completely familiar with all of their empirical results in that Davis and Weinstein paper, but I, I wanna say yes, otherwise it seems like, you know, what, you know, is this really a contradiction of the random growth framework if all that happened was buildings were destroyed, like you said. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna say probably there's more to it than just destruction of buildings, but I'm not completely positive. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions or I'll, I'll, I'll jump into the theory. Okay, uh, let's jump in. Um, so um, let me just start with some, some kind of preliminary stuff I have to lay out. And, and I've, I think I've streamlined things about as much as I, as I can. I, I will not get into, you know, unnecessary technical details that, that, that we don't you know, need to worry about too much. Um, but one thing that's, that's really important, um, that's not, it's probably not covered, probably most of you are not too familiar, is, is the lo notion of a, a, a local time. Um, so one thing we're going to want to do, you've already seen me, you know, heard me say rank many times, uh, we're going to look at systems of continuous processes, random processes, uh, and we're going to want to look at the rank 
processes, right? So we have these processes, they're positive, they're evolving in continuous time. Uh, we wanna look at the ranks, right? To, to be able to, Zipsol lend itself very naturally as do parallels to talking about ranks, you know, talk about log log plots of size versus rank. Rank will be very important here. Um, so there's no way to avoid the local time. Uh, I'm gonna denote the, the ranks with these parentheses so here, XK with parentheses is, is the kth rank process here. We're ranking on size. You can think of this as, the X is this frequency of words. You can think of it as the size of a city or a firm. Uh, I'm purposely going to be vague just because this is a mathematical theory that could potentially apply to a lot of, lots of applications. Um, when you get to the ranks, you can't just apply ETOs on this. So probably most of us know the, the sort of workhorse theory in continuous time to, to get the stochastic differential for the function of something is to take ETOs on it, but you can't do that with rank because it's not differentiable. So you have to introduce these local times, uh, which I'm denoting by lambda. A local time, I, I don't want to get into the technical definition. You can you can find it in Karatsas and Shreve. Um, you can find it in, in you know the papers that I've cited in this talk. Uh, I'm happy to point people to, to definitions. You can Google it if you want to. Um, but a local time for our purposes is, is a measure of crossovers and rank. Um, so these rank processes, XK with this parenthesis, it's just the process that occupies that rank at time t. So this RTI is a rank function. So you're saying, okay, whichever guy, whichever I is in rank k at time t, uh, this is an indicator. It's only going to be one for that one. Uh, and then we have these two local times, which are picking up crossovers in rank. And that's kind of the thing that distinguishes the rank process from the individual processes. So this lambda k, k plus one, this first local time is picking up situations where the k plus one rank process overtakes the kth rank process, right? There's a crossover in rank and one of them moves up and that one moves down. And when that happens, this lambda will move up. Uh, and the rate at which it increases is kind of the rate at which these crossovers are happening. Uh, same thing with the lambda k minus one k, except now we're talking about the kth rank process overtaking the k minus one rank process. Um, so local times, again, cannot be avoided, will, will be important. Uh, and even I think more to the point, uh, conceptually thinking of them as picking up crossovers uh, will be very important for thinking about the, the necessary and sufficient conditions that are going to give us its law. Um, okay, so the first class of models uh, we'll look at are, are pretty simple. They're called Atlas models. Um, and it's a system of, of processes that obey the strict form of Gibraltar's law. So, you know, you can think of taking out the, you can, without loss of generality, put in a common G bar growth rate for the whole system, but that doesn't change anything. And, and I wanted to keep things as simple as possible. So we just have the common growth rate be zero. It's been removed without loss of generality. So all of the processes are growing or drifting at the same rate, which is minus G. They're all kind of drifting downwards back into the system once you've taken out the aggregate growth and they all have the same variance sigma. Uh, this is a stationary model, uh, at least you, if you take out the geometric mean of, of the whole thing, uh, because you have n processes, you're going to have some leftover growth, you know, randomness in the whole system. So you have to kind of, you know, the, the whole system itself will be moving around. So you either have to look at the processes relative to each other or just take out the mean of the, of the system. Uh, but it, for all intents and purposes, this is a stationary model, um, and it obeys Gibraltar's law in that everybody's growing, drifting at the same rate, G downwards back into the system, and you all have the same volatility, sigma. Um, there's The reason it's called an atlas model is there's an atlas process at the bottom that stabilizes it. Um, you can't, uh, it's a well-known thing in economics and, and, and statistics that Gibraltar's law is not stationary. So you have to have something to make it stationary. These Gs can be thought of as relative growth rates, growth rate relative to the system. Um, to have all of the Gs add up to zero, you have to have the bottom process, you know, be the opposite of the previous process. So at the bottom, you have an atlas process that makes everything add up to zero. Um, as you'll see in the limit, when we get Zipp's law, that bottom process will go away, but uh, I'm jumping ahead a bit here. But you wanna think conceptually of an atlas model as a mathematical model of Gibraltar's law equal growth rates, equal volatilities, stationary model. Um, okay, much more general uh, than an Atlas model is a first order model. Uh, first order model is instead of saying that everybody's growing at the same rate and everybody has the same variance, you're going to have these G and Sigma or GK and Sigma K parameters that can vary across rank in any way you want them to. So you can have you know, higher growth rates at higher ranks, lower growth rates at lower ranks, 
Um, you can have a higher volatility at lower ranks, vice versa. You, you can vary them in any way you want to. There is a stationarity stability condition. You, you can't have the, the top of the system break away. Otherwise, it's not going to be stationary. Um, but otherwise, you know, as long as this condition is satisfied, you can have Gs and Sigmas vary any way you want. So you can have growth rates and volatilities vary any way you want. Uh, as long as this condition is satisfied, this will also be a stationary model. Uh, obviously, this is much more general than the Atlas model. This is all just, you know, the same growth rate for all the processes. And then finally, I have, uh, for simplicity, without loss of general generality, I have removed the common, you know, G-bar growth rate of the system, which I could put in there. Uh, and therefore, these Gs are interpreted as, as relative growth rates, right? Growth rates relative to the aggregate. Uh, and that means you need to have them add up to zero, which means we need to put something at the very bottom that has it, uh, you know, make sure that all the Gs, when they're added up, add up to zero. Um, so this Gn at the bottom is just kind of a, a mathematical necessity to make sure that the, the system is, once, it's, once you've taken out the aggregate growth, it's not growing. Uh, let me pause for a second and... Uh, See if there are questions here. Okay, great. Um, okay, so Atlas models are, are pretty well studied in, in, in math and, and statistics, uh, pretty well understood. And one thing we can say about them is that, you know, as I said, they're stationary, but we can say more than that. The, the gap processes. So if you look at the ranked, remember that the parentheses here, XK is, is rank. If you look at the gap processes, the log gap processes, so log xk minus log xk plus one, so rank k minus rank, rank k plus one, um, that is going to be exponentially distributed and its uh, distribution or its mean will be uh, these two parameters, sigma squared over two lambda. Uh, and here's where local times come back. Remember local times are measuring crossovers in rank. So the one of the parameters that gives you the mean of the exponential of the, um, of the distribution, the exponential distribution of the gap processes is the local time. Uh, and in an Atlas model, it's not hard to show that in a Gibraltar's law model, that that's just going to be 2 kg. So that common growth rate. So if I go back two slides quickly here, the common growth rate in the Atlas model, the drift rate is going to also be the local time in that model, the measure of crossovers and rank. And it's also going to be a key parameter for determining the stationary distribution, or at least the mean of that stationary distribution uh, in an Atlas model. Um, the other parameter is just the variance, um, the, the sigma squared K, it's just the variance of, of the two adjacent processes, which is just two sigma squared in, in a simple model like this. Um, now, we're concerned not so much with uh, you know, the gaps as we, we, we like log-log plots, right? Uh, the very start of my talk, I mentioned the log-log plot of, of word frequency versus rank. I showed you a bunch of plots from this nice Newman survey of log-log plots of, of size of cities versus rank. We'll look at size of firms versus rank in a few minutes. Um, so we'd like to look at the log-log plot of the X's, which is our, our size or frequency of words, it can be anything we want it to, it's a mathematical object, uh, over log K minus log K plus one. So that's the log log plot in the stationary distribution of size versus rank for an Atlas model. Uh, and using the approximation that log K minus log K plus one is about equal to one over K, you get that a straight line, right? You get a straight line uh, and the slope is minus sigma squared over two G. So it depends on these two parameters, the variance and the common drift growth rate of the, of the model. Uh, and so that tells us a couple of things. The first thing it tells us is Atlas models give us Pareto distributions. Uh, Atlas models give us Pareto distributions. This is a straight line. The log log size versus rank plot is a straight line. We know that means power law. Uh, but it also tells us if you want that straight line to have a slope of minus one, you're going to need sigma squared to equal to two G. Uh, that's the only way you get minus one. Uh, and so in some sense here, I'm giving you like a kind of a walkthrough of, of how I got to this result and how my co-author and I got to this result. The first thing was to say, okay, you get Zipp's law if sigma squared equals 2G. So then the next natural question was, well, why should sigma squared equal 2G? I mean, there's no particular reason to think that that has to be the case. Just like there's no particular reason to think that the straight lines of all these power laws we observe should be exactly equal to minus one. But that's in essence what answering Zipp's law is. Why is sigma squared equal to 2G? Um, okay, so the main result uh, in, in the paper that at least the first part of this talk is based on um, shows that Zipp's law, so sigma squared will equal 2G, 
So an atlas model, or to, to make things a little more precise, we define an atlas family, which is just a class of models. And the reason this is useful is you want to be able to expand the size of the models. We're going to take limits as n goes to infinity. So a family is just like a growing set of models where you can take more and more processes included in that model. You can increase n more and more. Um, the Atlas family is going to obey Zipf's law if and only if two conditions hold. And I'm going to walk through why these are reasonable conditions and try to convince you that all 100% of models, at least that I can think of, should obey them. Um, but I first want to state it, and then we'll walk through them together, and this will be important. Um, there is the need for a little bit more notation here. We'll use this XN bracket for the, the sum. Uh, remember that the parentheses are just the rank. So XN bracket is like the top N largest processes, the top N largest cities, firms. Uh, and in these RNs and RN brackets, it will be useful to look at the, the nth largest process relative to the biggest one and look at the top N relative to the biggest one. And that's all that these RNs and RN brackets do. Um, I'll come back to these. I know it's a lot to keep track of when necessary. They won't be too important, but they, they will show up. Um, but as long as these two conditions hold, um, this is an equivalence. It's an equivalence to Zipf's law. It's not just a one-way uh, result, but it's an equivalence. So if these two hold, you get Zipf's law. Um, if it's Zipf's law, then these two have to hold, uh, which is which is a stronger result. Um, okay, so let's think about why these conditions should hold. Uh, so let me start with the first condition here, uh, and I think of this as sort of a, a conservation, uh, is, is what we call it, and it's it's sort of a conservation of mass condition. So. I'm gonna use Zs throughout the talk to refer to systems of data. We're, we're modeling the data with these stochastic processes, which we denote by X. We use Zs to denote systems of data. Data can be messy. Uh, you know, the size of the, the system can change. Uh, they can be sampled at different times. I'll use tau as, as when they're sampled, maybe every year, maybe every month, maybe every minute. Um, but the basic idea here is if we take enough ranks the size of the top n, so as we make n big, should be approximately constant over time. So let me give you uh, an argument for why that should be the case. Suppose we're, we're let's go with the word example. Uh, suppose we're looking at 10,000 words from Wikipedia as we did at the start of this talk. Uh, and suppose I look at 10,000 words from Wikipedia every year. Uh, and I just sample 10,000, I just take the first 10,000. I'm not gonna look at all of Wikipedia, it's too big, so I'll just take the first 10,000 words I can find. Um, as long as I take enough ranks from that sample of 10,000 words, the size, the count of words in that top n subset of ranked words by frequency should be constant over time because the sample is constant over time. You can't expect that thing to be growing or declining on average over time. It should, like the sample, be constant on average over time. So it's reasonable for large n that the change in the size of the top n words from time tau plus one to tau, the frequency, uh, and now I just express it in percentage terms by dividing by zn tau, that should be approximately equal to zero on average over time. Uh, and now, you know, you can do a simple manipulation. Instead of having zn tau in the denominator, I put the, the top observation z1 and multiply by zn over z1. It's, you know, simple algebraic manipulation. But this statement here, which is based on this very intuitive argument about sampling 10,000 words each year from Wikipedia, uh, is just an expression of the conservation condition, the first condition that's equivalent to Zipf's law from before. This is the condition. Dxn is just the change in Zn. Remember, Xs are from the model, and we're working in continuous time, so I have to say Dxn. But that's just a way of saying Zn tau plus 1 minus as Zn tau in terms of our continuous time model. Z1 is just you know, X1. Uh, again, Xs are the, are the model, Zs are the data. And finally, Rn brackets, we've probably forgotten what it is, but Rn brackets is just Xn over X1 or Zn over Z1 in terms of data. So this first condition, half of what gets us to Zipf's law or an equivalence with Zipf's law, uh, conservation is essentially just a statement that if you cover enough ranks, right, as N gets large, you should not expect your system to grow or shrink in aggregate size. It's a conservation of mass condition. And I would argue, and that hopefully uh, I'm convincing, that 100% of models should obey this, right? It's not reasonable to expect this thing to be positive or negative, provided N is large enough uh, on average. That makes no sense, right? No, no appropriate 
proper model should have that condition. At least I can't think of a real world case where that would that would be what happens. Uh, so I, I want to clarify. Uh, mm -hmm. So is this just a statistical argument or or what's the nature of the argument? I mean, um, so there used to be about 8,000 stocks in the uh, uh, Wilshire 5,000. There's now like 4,000. They've cut roughly in half. Um, um, so the mass of the top 4,000, well, it used to be half of the total number, although probably almost all of the uh, uh, market cap but, but now it's, it's everything. Um, um, so that seems to be a little bit at, uh, in conflict with this conservation um, argument, but I'm, I'm asking more fundamentally, why, why do you believe the conservation? Uh, I think, it's, I think it's, from? it's a statistical, I mean, it's kind of a, a, a statistical sort of philosophy of modeling argument. So, um, so you're right. If if the size of the system shrinks, uh, then um, you're going to run into problems. The, the, the issue there is, you know, if it continues to shrink, the thing's going to disappear, right? There, there won't be, you know, it won't be stationary anymore. It's just gone. So um, it's, you know, I mean, okay, it can be stationary for a while, and then at some point it shrinks so much that there's some different distribution. Uh, and that's that. In that case, I would argue this is not the appropriate way to model it. Now, if for a long time you have a lot of stocks and the stocks are, you know, the number of stocks is increasing for a while, which uh, I'm not an, a historian of, of the stock market, but that's my sense of how it was at least for a while, um, then this argument should apply because you can make the same argument I made for words and sampling 10,000 of them for dollars, right? You could say, let's sample, you know, uh, whatever, a trillion um, stock market capitalization dollars randomly from companies. I know you can't actually do it, but there's nothing wrong with that argument. Um, just like you could sample randomly people from cities in the United States, say we're going to sample 100 million people randomly from cities. As long as your N, your ranks coverage is, is large enough, that random sample should have the same distribution as the, the true full system. And also it shouldn't be trending up or down on average over time. Now, if your system is shrinking as what's happened with stocks uh, and that persists for an extended period of time, then uh, I would think two things. I mean, the first thing I would think is it'd be hard to see how stationarity and Zipfian type distributions would, would persist. Uh, and then probably this wouldn't be the framework to think about it because your system's shrinking. And, and if it keeps shrinking, you know, eventually you're going to have something that doesn't really look like it looked before. Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think that's an interesting case. Yeah, that's, that's how I would think about it. But yes, it's a statistical and sort of philosophy of modeling argument. Um, so, so let me try to say that back to you. So, so suppose the total number of, of, um, uh, of firms is constant. Then what you're saying is that um, the fraction of the mass that's in the top little n of the universe capital and that should be roughly constant over time. Yeah. Is, that, is that the argument? So there ought to be, there's some stationary distribution that we're up. Okay. Yeah, and even so it's, it, it, it's, it's basically stationarity of the log log plot of rank versus um, size. Yeah, and I would even push a little further than that. I, I mean, definitely what you said is true. Yes, 100% agree. But I would even push a little further and say, uh, take words. Uh, you know, words are, are increasing over time. Some words might fall out of favor and not be used much anymore. But the number of words is going up. But still, if you're sampling 10,000 from Wikipedia every year, and you cover enough ranks, that system should be conservative, right? It, it, just because you're sampling 10,000 words, therefore, as long as your number of ranks is large enough, the, um, the, the size of the top end rank should also be conservative and maintaining its size over time. Even though the system is getting bigger and bigger, there are more and more words in Wikipedia and there's more and more, um, uh, there are more and more new words that are appearing. Uh, so I'll say more about new words in a second because the second condition is, is more about the new words. Can I, ask, can I ask another question about the sampling? So do you take 10,000 words from Wikipedia and then look at the frequency distribution within that? Or are you taking 10,000 different words and then computing the full 
frequency. No, 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 10,000 words. Yeah, so you're gonna have, obviously some words are gonna show up a lot and some words aren't gonna show up that much, but it's just 10,000 words with repeats. Um, so that first figure I showed, that's 10,000 words from Wikipedia. And obviously some of them show up a lot of times. Um, so it's not different words, it's just words and there'll be lots of repeats. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, these are these are good questions. Uh, any other questions? This, this is important. I, I mean, I hope you know if I do my job well today, you guys will come out at least partially convinced that this should hold for for almost all of our models. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me move to the second condition. Then. Uh, okay. So the second condition is completeness, and, and uh, Bob's question about sort of a, a new. Um, or at least our conversation about sort of new words and new things popping up. This this is applies a lot to completeness. Uh, so um, so again, let me start with the systems of data. I'm going to make another statistical slash philosophy of modeling argument. Um, so we have a system of data, and in that system of data, we can measure the the sort of the turnover, the replacement or or displacement, as I like to say, within the top end ranks from time tau to time tau plus one with this quantity here. So what do we have here? Zn tau plus one, that's just the size of, um, and let me, let's use city sizes this time instead of words, I used words before. So this is the size of the, the largest cities at time tau plus one of the largest n cities. It's how big they are, total population. Um, the quantity here, r tau i is just the rank at time tau uh, of that individual i. So this is looking at the biggest cities, the previous observation time tau, this is tau plus one, this is tau, but it looks at their size at time tau plus one. So it's like the biggest observations, biggest cities last year, how big they are this year. The difference between these two, which is, you know, can't be negative, it's, it's non-negative, obviously, because these are the biggest now, these are the biggest last year, but it's how big they are now. The difference between those two is a measure of displacement, right? If a lot of new cities move into the top N, then um, you're going to expect a big difference here between this, because a lot of cities that used to be biggest are no longer biggest, and so there's a big difference between the biggest today versus the biggest last year. Uh, on the other hand, if there are no new cities that enter the top 100 or the top n, then this will be zero, because the top cities at time tau and the top cities at time tau plus one are the same, and so obviously there's no change. And so in some sense, this is a quantitative measure of replacement or displacement or crossovers or you know uh, turnover within the system, or at least within the top n ranks. Now, again, I'm going to make another large end argument. If you take, and this is even, I, I think this is more a philosophy of modeling than statistical argument, going back to Bob's question from before. Um, for large enough n, um, you, your system should be complete, meaning that this quantity should tend to zero if you cover enough ranks. Otherwise, what you're saying is there's a quantitatively meaningful contribution to your system, to your model that is coming from outside of the model because an atlas model is modeling the top n ranks of the city size distribution of the top n firms of the firm size distribution obviously there's more than n firms i'm going to show you a plot later of the 5000 largest publicly traded stocks uh, and you know there are more than 5000 stocks so there's something outside of the system that comes in and displaces it so the argument here is that for enough ranks that displacement that outside of the model contribution should tend to zero uh, that's saying that this should tend to zero. This is just the same thing. So all I've done here is I've added a, a Zn tau to both of these. So those just cancel. And then I've made things in percentage terms of the Zn tau and the denominator. But basically what we're saying is for large n, this displacement replacement uh, quantitative term should be tending to zero. Uh, and your model should be complete on its own. It shouldn't be depending on something that's outside the model. Now it's not really a statistical argument. It's a modeling philosophy of modeling argument. Um, your model should be complete on its own. It shouldn't be depending on, you know, it shouldn't be depending in a quantitatively meaningful way on something that is not explicitly in the model. That's what this is a statement of. Now, in terms of, um, you know, the continuous processes, the X's, the, the, the mathematical model that I presented, uh, this is this is what that expression is. So the only new thing here is instead of having Zn brackets in the uh, denominator, I've multiplied everything by Z1 and derided everything by Z1, and so you get a you get a x1 in the denominator, and then you get x1 over xn, which is just uh, uh, what you know. That's what Rn is. Um, so it's 
you know, this one extra step here of multiplying and dividing by x1, which is just one, obviously. Uh, but otherwise, this statement here is a statement of this condition, which is just a statement of this being equal to zero. Again, done in terms of x's, because we're talking about our mathem mathematical model now. Remember, dxn is just, you know, the change in, in the top n, which is, you know, this in discrete time. Uh, and here again, the dxi is just the changes in the i's in, in discrete time. Um, but this expression, uh, in terms of the model, is just saying that as n gets large, the model should be complete. It should not be depending on displacement from outside of it. That displacement should be tending to zero. It should not be quantitatively meaningful. Um, now, the interesting thing here, and this is where local times become important again, is you can show, it's not hard to show, it's in the paper I cited, and I'm not going to go through the proof now, but you can show pretty easily that this term here is just equal to, you know, uh, uh, some uh, xn times the local time at rank n, n plus one. So remember, a local time measures crossovers in rank. So this displacement term is really just a local time term, and it's measuring crossovers from rank n plus one into n, which hopefully makes intuitive sense. If we're trying to measure the displacement, the replacement of processes in the top n, that's going to depend on crossovers from rank n plus one into rank n. And of course, the local time at n, n plus one, uh, or lambda n, n plus one, that local time is a measure of crossovers in rank. So it's, it's not shocking that we get this local time to reappear here. Um, it turns out, you can kind of see where I'm going with this, it's not hard to show, and in fact, we've already seen it, uh, the, the local time at n, n plus one, the measure of crossovers between rank n and n plus one for an atlas model is just 2ng. So we can replace lambda here with 2ng. Note that 2 and g are just constants, so when we take limits, they don't matter. Uh, and so what we get is we get, uh, in terms of an atlas model, this being approximately equal to zero for large n is just this statement here. Limit is n tends to infinity of this quantity, uh, which in terms of these r's uh, is written like this, is just zero. So the second condition that gives us Zipf's law uh, that's equivalent to Zipf's law is the completeness condition. And really what it means in terms of systems of data is your system should not depend, once you cover enough ranks, on displacement from outside of the system. It should, it should be self-contained. It should be complete on its own. It shouldn't depend on some outside phenomena. That's what this is a statement of. Uh, and that's it. Let me, you know, I'll jump back here for a second. These two conditions, the conservation and the completeness, are equivalent to Zipf's law in an Atlas model, which is a model of Gibraltar's law. So can I interpret completeness as saying there are no uh, tech startups? Is that what that's saying? Not necessarily. It's more saying that that tech startups should not quantitatively, um, you know, they should not meaningfully quantitatively impact the model. That that's that's how I would think of it. Um, so a model can never you you can't have a model that obeys Gibraltar's law that is hundred percent complete because you have to have something at the bottom. You've got to have an ng at the bottom. But what this is saying is. As n gets big, the contribution of this uh, bottom processes, which is the startups basically, is going to zero as n gets large. And so the startups are not going to quantitatively meaningfully impact the system. Now, again, you know, the real world can be more complex than that. We have IPOs, right? Coinbase IPOs is a pretty large company. Now, does that quantitatively uh, meaningfully impact the, the stock market dynamics? Well, I'll show you evidence that not that much, that this actually aligns with the theorem. But uh, in the real world, you, you're not ever going to be perfectly complete, right? All you can hope to do is to be very complete. Um, and in some, it's conceivable that some systems that entry and exit, uh, the, you know, the startups uh, metaphorically are so important that, that you can't be complete. Um, but a model, uh, a model should strive to be complete. So, uh, so let me ask that in more concrete terms. So suppose we're back in 1975 uh, or whatever the right date is, Apple hasn't yet been founded. Um, so do we want to think of this as that there's a, a nascent apple that's sitting somewhere uh, in this, but of course it's, it's very small, so you don't see it. I mean, because it, it's now the biggest uh, stock by market cap in the US by, um, you know, the, actually several of the biggest stocks by market cap uh, did not exist in 1975 at all. But are we thinking they're sitting in, in kind of a, um, you know, a sea of, of really tiny ones? 
Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that's exactly right. That's exactly how I would think of it. There, there's some Epsilon Apple in 1975 that's, you know, outside of our top end ranks, even for very large and no impact on the market. And then at some point, suddenly this, this Apple starts to grow and it crosses over into the top end. As long as your N is large enough, when it crosses over, it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't make too big of a quantitative impact on the aggregate growth of the system. Now, once it's in the top end, you know, the theory applies. But before that, uh, and, and crucially, when it makes that crossover, that's when you shouldn't have that meaningful quantitative impact. That's so, we want to, so we want to think of uh, Apple as having always existed, basically, but. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me mull that over. Yeah. It's, I mean, I put it two ways, right? So the, the Atlas model is really just a model of the top end ranks. It's kind of agnostic about what's happening outside. Um, when we flip to the Z's, of course, Apple did not exist in 1975, right? We, we know that. Um, and, you know, new processes appear, right? There, you know, Apple appears. Um, the, the important thing is when those new processes, processes appear and then when they cross over into the top end, once they cross over, enter into the model, as long as the impact of that entry is not too quantitatively important, then we can get something that's close to completeness. That, that's, that's how I would think of it. So it's almost like you don't have to worry about in the model what Apple's doing before it comes into the top end. You just have to worry about its impact on the top end when it enters. And that's why I would worry more about a Coinbase or I don't know, maybe there's some other company that IPO'd even bigger uh, than an Apple, um, you know, or, or like a, a non-existent Apple in 1975, because we're modeling the top end. And if something jumps into the top end pretty high up, then it could have a quantitatively meaningful impact on that top end uh, at the moment when it enters. And, and that's starting to push a little bit against, you know, the things that we need to hold to get, get the SIPS law distribution. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a useful thought experiment. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, is, that, is that a question I saw someone? No? Okay. Uh, well, feel free to chime in. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, because we only got about half an hour, I'm going to skip the proof. The, the proof is actually really pretty straightforward, although I will say that getting the equivalence between the two conditions in zip law is, is not an easy thing to do, and, and essentially I think would be extremely difficult to do outside of this framework. Um, uh, let me let me push into the, the weaker form of zip law. I, I want to leave at least you know ten, ideally fifteen minutes for applications, uh, and it's going to be tight. So um, these are the old Pareto distribution plots, zip law plots for, from Newman that we saw earlier. Um, one thing we'll notice, uh, and I'm going to do this a little quicker than I'd like, but if you look at some of these plots, uh, I think city size really stands out in this respect. You can't quite see it for wealth, but if you go further down the wealth distribution, this is just the top 400, you, you get a curvature, right? You, you get a curve distribution, uh, which is not necessarily exactly a power law, maybe a power law on the tail. Um, now, I think what's really interesting is you can take basically what we just did, uh, those two conditions of conservation and completeness, uh, and show that these curve distributions are also implications uh, of those two conditions, which again, I think are very natural and should basically be holding for, for uh, you know, the vast majority of our models. Um, how do we do that? Well, we want to extend beyond Gibraltar. So we want to extend beyond the, um, the Atlas model. So I'm going to introduce something called a quasi-Atlas model, which still obeys Gibraltar's law for growth rate. So you still have all of this, the processes growing at the same rate drifting down relatively at a rate of G, but now you can have variances that linearly increase with rank. Um, so as you go down the distribution, the variance of that growth goes up. If you do that, um, you can characterize the stationary distribution in this case, uh, and you can show that the log log plot of uh, size versus rank, so XK minus versus K, uh, is not going to be a straight line anymore. It's going to be a curve. Uh, and you can see that because if we look at the slope, these sigmas, remember the sigmas are now increasing with K. So as you go down the distribution, the variance gets bigger. So this you know, quantity in the numerator goes up as we go down the distribution, as we increase K. So this, the curve, the, the log log plot of size versus rank is curved with an increasing slope, a more and more negative slope as K goes up. Um, now you can show that 
if you have a quasi Atlas family, it will be quasi Ziphian, meaning I've already alluded to this, but let me be precise about it. The log log plot is concave and it has a tangent of minus one somewhere. So minus one shows up. Remember, Zip's law is just a straight line with slope minus one. Quasi Zip's law, quasi Ziphian distribution is concave curve with a tangent of minus one. The same two conditions that for a full Gibraltar's law model, Atlas model gave us Zip's law, are going to give us. Uh, quasi Zips law for a quasi Atlas model with higher variances now at lower ranks. And we need one more condition, which is we can't have the top process be too big. If the top process is too big, uh, it screws up things with the aggregate variance and growth of the system. So as long as the top process is not half of your entire system, which is you know not the case obviously for stocks and, and other things uh, and, and many applications, um, then conservation Conservation and completeness, the same two conditions we just walked through and, and discussed, will give you uh, quasi Zips law for a quasi Atlas model. Um, and I think this is, I think this is interesting because it's you know we don't have to invent new conditions to get you know this quasi Zips law. It's the same two conditions that gave us Zips law are giving the weaker form of Zips law. And this is why I think of those two distributions as very closely related. I mean, in some sense, you can say okay, Zips law is when you have pure Gibraltar's law and you get that that line of slope minus one. Um, quasi Zips law is when you have Gibraltar's law for growth rates, but the variances are increasing with rank, uh, and then you get this this quasi uh, Zips law in that case. But the two are very closely related. Uh, okay, so why is this a useful notion? Well, this is the distribution of firm sizes uh, measured by market cap, market firm sizes of stocks uh, from 2010 to 2019. And what you observe is you observe a concave curve, and there's a tangent of minus one somewhere around here on the on the curve. Um, so this looks like a quasi Ziphian distribution. I, I will make sure I get to show you to, to show that you can model this type of market well using this type of framework and that this market obeys the assumptions of a quasi Atlas model. Uh, and also, as you can clearly see, it, it, it's consistent with the conclusions of the previous theorem where we're getting a, a quasi Ziphian distribution as well. Uh, but even again, a little bit more provocative, what I said earlier in the talk, even some of these original Zips law plots with the 10,000 words from Wikipedia in different languages, there's a little bit of curvature in, in most of these plots, right? There's a little bit of concavity. So you can make the case that maybe these are actually, um, you know, uh, quasi uh, Zips law and not Zips law. And the way to, to see if that's a, an interesting thing to say would be to look at the variance of the growth and the frequency of words over, I mean, this would be a, a, a pretty big undertaking because you'd have to look over very many years to get enough, uh, you know, uh, variation uh, in, in growth of words, but in theory, um, you know, potentially it's this, there's higher variance of, of word growth, frequency of, of words, and it's growth over time at lower ranks than at higher ranks, and that might explain some of this curvature. I, that's a speculation. I don't have evidence of that, but that's where the theorem pushes us. Uh, okay. Um, let me say a couple of words here. I, since we've already talked about this dichotomy between, you know, kind of Zipfian Pareto distributions and non Zipfian Pareto distributions, I'll make this quick. But, but I do think it's a, it's it's a novel. I, I had not heard before working on this project this idea that uh, everybody talks about power laws, Pareto distributions, how ubiquitous they are. But I have not heard this sort of separation between kind of time dependent rank based systems that gives you power laws like, you know, firm size, city size, even word frequency, income, wealth, uh, versus uh, cumulative things like earthquakes and book sales and war intensity. Um, but the theory makes a very clear distinction, right? The, the theory I laid out is appropriate for these types of time dependent rank based systems. And if they obey Gibraltar's law, then they should be Zipfian. And if they obey quasi Gibraltar, like the weaker form of Gibraltar with the, the constant growth, but uh, a variance that's higher at lower ranks, then it should, it should be quasi Zipfian, at least if you cover enough ranks. Uh, and uh, conservation and completeness should hold in the limit uh, in the vast majority of cases. Uh, on the other hand, these other systems are completely different and our theory has nothing to say about them. And so there's no real reason to expect them to uh, obey Zips law or quasi Zips law or anything like that. Uh, and so that dichotomy I think is useful. Um, since we've already talked about this, uh, I'll just you know briefly reiterate it, but uh, it is really important to approach this question with a mathematical theory, right? It, it is not appropriate to have field specific explanations of Zips law because it is so common. Everything I've said, I mean, I'm an economist, I don't know anything about how, you know, word distributions are modeled, but everything that I've said, all the mathematical theory I laid out 
is applicable to, uh, as far as I can tell, to sort of the growth of word frequencies in different written languages. Uh, and that's important because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it would be sort of an incredible coincidence if it just so happens you get the identical distribution in economics as you get in linguistics, and there's just completely different phenomena that give rise to them. It's not impossible, but it it's just seems, uh, uh, you know, incredibly unlikely, uh, just like with the central limit theorem, which we now all know the reason the central limit theorem appears in so many fields is because of the theorem we learned in our statistics or econometrics classes in, in graduate school or undergrad. Um, and, and, you know, we took the same approach to thinking about um, Zipp's law and its universality. Um, okay, so let me uh, spend the remaining 20 minutes. This is perfect, actually. I, I thought I'd have less time on applications. Uh, I think actually we'll have plenty of time for everything, which is great. Um, again, I'm going to be using these Zs to... Um, denote systems of data as I've been doing before. Um, so one thing you can do that I, I think is also novel uh, within this framework, at least in, in other attempts I've seen to try to explain uh, Zipp's law it, within fields is you can just take systems of data in any field. Uh, and again, you, you could do this with the words as I was you know, suggesting might be the case uh, um, as well, where, where Z is just the frequency of some word in, in a given year when you look at Wikipedia or, or wherever you want to look. Um, and you can approximate a first order model for that. So basically, you, you try to figure out what the, the growth rates are at the different ranks. You, you calculate the uh, estimate the variances at the different ranks. Um, so I have, uh, I have a paper that discusses how to do that. It's, it's not a particularly difficult thing to do. There are some technical challenges that come in. You know, I, I, Bob alluded to some of the issues that appear when you know, new companies suddenly appear in the middle of the distribution. There are complications. When you work with real world data, things get messy, um, but there are ways of addressing those various issues um, to basically estimate these GK and Sigma K parameters, essentially build a model like this for a real world system of data. So map from the Zs to the Xs and figure out what the appropriate Gs and Sigmas would be to do that. Um, and so I'm going to show you what happens when you do that with, uh, uh, and keep coming back to the sort of firm size measured by total market capitalization distribution. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, what happens when you do that. I'll, I'll briefly just mention, um, there's, there's really a fascinating thing. Maybe you could, you could kind of see, you've already seen in the, in the things that came up in, in this talk, but uh, obviously, you know, the size of a company, the market cap of a company is related to returns, right? When there's a capital gain, most of the time a company gets bigger, uh, right? The, the market, the size of the company goes up. So there's clearly a link here between growth of companies, size of companies, um, the distribution of market caps, the distribution of market firm sizes, and also returns. I'm not going to get into it in this talk. Um, you know, this talk has been focused on, on various things, but there's a large literature on this in, in, uh, in math, finance, and statistics that I think is really interesting. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that, uh, but I will not go there in this talk. I'm happy to discuss it if there's time at the end or, or some other time. Um, uh, but this is the application we want to look at for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is when we implement this procedure that I lay out in this paper, um, you can show that basically the, the parameters you get uh, looking at the data, the system of, of, of growth of companies, uh, looks a lot like a quasi-atlas model. So what does that mean? It means that Gibraltar's law approximately holds for the, the, um, the growth rates of, of the market caps of the various companies at different ranks. Uh, we're gonna do it, I'll do it for 5,000 uh, ranks, 5,000 companies. I think that's what it is, we'll see it in a second. Uh, and also the variances linearly, approximately linearly increase with rank. Um, and so what that means, if we, if we take the theory I just laid out seriously, then we think, you know, as long as N is large, right, if you take a sufficient number of ranks, and as long as the issues that, 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 that you know, Bob correctly pointed to before about IPOs and, and, you know, Apple not existing and then existing, all those things aren't too significant, and we take enough ranks, then, you know, our theory is saying that a quasi-atlas model should give us a quasi-Zipfian distribution, meaning not a straight line, not a classic Pareto distribution. This distribution is typically not uh, one of the ones that's uh, considered to be Pareto, um, but you will get this quasi-Zipfian distribution that I laid out, which means a concave log-log plot of size versus rank uh, with a tangent of minus one somewhere. Um, and you know you can tell where this is going. That's that's what happens. Um, so here are the the actual estimates using data from 1990 to 1999 using monthly observations. Um, you can see that the the here in red are the uh, 
the growth rates, you can see that they're they're pretty constant across rank. It's not going to be perfect. And, and by the way, you can you can smooth this more. You can use a wider bandwidth on your your smoother. These parameters are obviously smooth, um, but this is pretty close to Gibraltar's law for growth rates. So at least as close as you'll get with you know a finite sample of real world data where messy things happen. Uh, and also the the variances here, the sigmas are in black, and you can see that they linearly increase with rank. Again, it's not perfect, but you could smooth this with a wider bandwidth or more times, and then you would get something that looks more like a straight line. The point, more generally, is you know these two lines are you know pretty consistent with a quasi atlas model, meaning constant g's and linearly increasing sigmas as you go down the distribution. Um, so again the distribution should be quasi-Zipfian, and, and in fact it is. Um, so uh, the black line here is the, the average distribution, uh, size of companies at different ranks. Um, yes, for 5,000 companies, I was correct. Um, the black dot is where the tangent of minus one happens, so it confirms it's in fact a quasi-Zipfian distribution as I've defined it. But I think what's even more interesting here is the red line gives you the predicted distribution from the model. So what do I mean by that? So since we have some time, this is good that we're not rushed here. Uh, let me just circle back for a second. So um, we know from the theory that a quasi-atlas model, the stationary distribution can be characterized, the, the gaps will, will look like this. Um, and in particular, the, um, the log log plot of size versus rank, which is what, what I'm showing you now for the, the real data. But for the model, it should, it should have this slope where basically the slope increases with the increasing variance, sigma squared K. So if you, if you literally take those parameters, those Gs and those sigmas uh, that um, we estimate here. So you literally take these estimates and plug that into the formula predicted for the, the log log plot by the model, the statistical model, mathematical model, you plug it in, you get this red curve. Uh, and so you can see that the predicted distribution of this uh, data, you know, data estimated parameterized model uh, aligns very nicely with the actual distribution, which is important because if you're getting a predicted distribution that's way off from the actual distribution, then the, 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 what that would tell you is that this model is, is inappropriate, right? That the model is failing to capture the actual capital distribution curve. But what we see here is that it, it does seem to capture the actual distribution curve pretty well. It's not perfect, uh, nor can you expect it to be, uh, you know, when you're working with real world data and finite samples, but it's close. It's close. If the red line was off from the black line, like really far off, um, you know, I'd be very worried and I, I wouldn't be showing this to you, obviously, uh, but it's not. And so I, I think um, what I like about this as an example is a couple of things. One, it shows that this is an appropriate model for modeling this, this system, the, the, the size of companies and how they grow over time, um, market size of companies. Uh, and second, it shows that the theorem uh, is applying, which is if something thing can be appropriately modeled with a quasi atlas model, then enough ranks are taken, then you should get this, uh, you know, quasi Zipfian distribution concave curve with tangent of minus one. And that's what you get. And notice, by the way, had we stopped at 50 ranks or something, not a very large end, we would get something that's not Zip's law, right? It's flatter than minus one. And it's not quasi Zip's law, even though it's a little bit concave at the top, it doesn't tangent at minus one. So to get that tangent, to get that distribution, you really do need to increase N. So the, the taking the large N uh, is very important. Uh, and in fact, you know, a model can never be complete in the sense uh, that I presented before for any finite N. Like you can never actually be complete and obey Gibraltar's law. Uh, it's non-stationary. So you always have to have some contribution from outside the system, whether it's the IPOs or the apples that just suddenly move into the top 5,000 and were, were outside it before. The point, though, is that as N gets large, that contribution of the IPOs and the apples moving in is small. That's, that's the important thing, quantitatively small. Rick, can I ask a question? Please. Is there a particular date associated with this picture? I'm not exactly uh, yes. sure. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I should have been clear. Yeah, this is data from 1990 to 1999. Yeah. It's from 19. Well, capitalizations are on any fixed day. Yeah, so this is the average distribution uh, monthly data over that decade. Yeah, so it's the, the average. average. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So here's a question. Sure. If you tried to, to make a time series of those curves, like a movie. Sure. How, how does that how, how, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, 
a couple things to say there. So clearly the curve, you know, is not just this every day, right? Or every month we're looking at monthly data. Right. Um, so the curve moves around and it moves around a decent amount. And I, and I think what's even more, that's not so much a time series as it is just a way of visualizing the, the curve over time. But but there, there are plots like that. And the, I think the interesting thing though, um, is when you do that, what you find is that the curve moves more than is predicted by this model, right? This model, also would predict some stochastic variation in the top rank versus this top second rank at each you know time t or discrete intervals or whatever you want but what you observe in the data is more fluctuation in the distribution than is predicted by the model so the model doesn't capture everything uh, it, it's good at capturing the average distribution over a decade but it does not capture the the fluctuation in that distribution that occurs from month to month uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why that may be, but that's a that's a okay. really good point. Uh, and there is, yeah, there's been not a lot, but some work has been done looking at those types of questions. Not a lot, though. Uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah. I, yeah. I hope we can follow up about that. It's a point yeah. of interest. For me. Yeah. No, that's a, it's, a, it's a great point. It's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. So let me. I, I mean, that's actually a great segue to to think a little bit more. It's actually a perfect segue. I wasn't sure if there was another slide. So. Last thing I'll do here, we got we got ten minutes and the timing worked out great, which is which is nice. Um, is you can already see uh, from Lisa's questions, some of Bob's questions from before, and even some of the things that I, I mentioned at the, the start of the talk. Um, there are some things that that this framework, which is admittedly it's a pretty simplistic framework, it's just a rank based model, right? Everything it's an ergodic model, ex ante all the processes are the same. Um, there's some things that this misses, right? There's some real world things that this misses. For example, the day-to-day the -day or month-to-month -month fluctuations of that capital distribution, uh, this, this model doesn't do a good job of capturing that. So one reason why that may be is there may be some, some sort of persistent or, or permanent heterogeneity in the behavior of certain stocks relative to others or certain words relative to others. For example, uh, you know, um, and is, you know, probably very different from soliloquy or something in English, like it's, it's treating them as the same words just separated by the random growth that and happened to have and soliloquy did not is probably wrong, right? I mean, there's just something and is an important uh, conjunction that we're likely to stay very high in the distribution for really the foreseeable future in English. Uh, maybe the same thing is true of Apple versus some other small company that there's just something fundamentally different about it that makes it likely to stay in that um, higher rank uh, for longer. So one way to think about that type of heterogeneity is to introduce uh, these gamma I parameters, which are essentially name-based or index-based, however you want to think of it, uh, parameters. And what this does is it introduces a, a persistent permanent heterogeneity. This is a relatively new thing. Not surprisingly, you know, when you start doing this, and especially if you let all of these parameters vary, things get very complicated very quickly. Um, um, but you know, a couple of things can be said. First of all, these second order models, um, you know, it's not ergodic. The processes are not exchangeable, meaning you cannot just you know, consider rank. Rank is not enough, right? Different processes now will spend different amounts of time in each rank. So I didn't get into this before. We got a few minutes, so I'll, I'll touch on it now. Uh, in the previous model, the first order model, the model where we did not have this parameter, we just had the GKs and the sigma Ks. In that model, as you take T to infinity, every single XI will spend one over N of its time in each rank because they're all the same. That, that has to be the case. It's, it's sort of a trivial result. Um, that's not the case anymore once you introduce these gamma I terms, once you introduce this permanent heterogeneity. And in particular, the, the processes, the eyes with higher gammas will spend more time in higher ranks than the eyes with lower gammas. So maybe we think Apple is fundamentally different from you know, some small company. And so we just expect that it will spend more time in a higher rank uh, all else equal than you know that other company. It's not just that Apple got lucky and randomly got big, but actually there's some fundamental difference between them. Or maybe we think and is fundamentally different from soliloquy. So we expect that and will spend more time in higher ranks of the word frequency distribution than soliloquy will. Well, that would mean you know different gammas, or it's one way to model that is with different gammas. Uh, and in this case, Everything I said about Zipps law, quasi Zipps law, that no longer holds. Uh, even if we're talking about you know distributions with you know common G's or common sigmas, it still doesn't hold. Uh, okay, so the first place, and, and you know Lisa, your comment I think is is, is aligns nicely with this. Um, it's not fluctuations over time, but it is a one snapshot look 
at the um, uh, the market cap distribution from uh, December 2020. Unfortunately, that was the, the most recent date I could get. My, my my crisp had not updated. They were supposed to do it this month with the 2021 data. So I got December 2020, but it came out pretty nicely anyway. Um, basically, post pandemic, we've probably all heard anyway. But like the largest companies have gotten bigger. Uh, and, and not just everybody got bigger, but they got bigger relative to all the other companies. And you can see that in this black line here. You see a, a pretty clear deviation from, um, you know, a, a quasi Zips law. The, the uh, red line is the average from 2010 to 2019. So this is a slightly different decade than, than what I showed you before. But basically, the curve always looks kind of like the, the red dash one, usually when you take averages. But since 2020 or late 2020, post pandemic, um, there's been this deviation. And as far as I know, it's persisted. I know a lot's been happening in the stock market already in January. So I don't know if it still persists, but you know, I could have taken December, 2021, and it would look probably even more pronounced than this. Um, and so, you know, one cause could be, you know, Lisa's point that maybe this is just a fluctuation from one month to the other, that the model doesn't do a good job of capturing. That's certainly possible. Another possibility is that there is a, a gamma for these companies, right? That is causing them to, you know, just, uh, you know, you can easily, not easily, but you can show that if a company has a higher gamma, you would expect frequently a distribution where those companies kind of deviate from the quasi Zipfian distribution, even if the underlying Gs and Sigmas are quasi Atlas, right? Equal Gs and linearly increasing Sigmas with rank. You put in a higher gamma for, for Microsoft and Apple and Amazon and, um, you know, the, those top companies, you start to get something that looks like this. So I, I don't have proof. I haven't done the analysis. I, I'm speculating here. But one potential explanation for this would be this type of deviation from uh, the rank-based theory that I was presenting before. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the case. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe it's a temporary fluctuation. These are all potential explanations. But one would also be the emergence of something like this. Uh, um, I mentioned city size. Uh, Bob asked a good question earlier. Um, I, my understanding of the, of the Davis and Weinstein work is that there were a lot of casualties and then that the city size distribution in terms of population it wasn't just structures, uh, was, was substantially altered. Now, how much the ranks changed, I don't know. It's a, it's a great question. Um, this is not something I've, I've worked on yet, but I, I, think it's, I think it's an interesting idea. I've floated the idea with, with some people who are more in this literature. Um, but it's it's not hard to explain the return of sort of the Tokyo to being in the top ranks after it's destroyed um, if you if you throw in this type of parameter, uh, right? If you throw in this type of parameter, then you would expect that the cities with that high parameter, which I'm speculating would be Tokyo, to move back into those top ranks. Um, so again, a second order model with some permanent persistent heterogeneity could potentially explain or will is a potential explanation of what we observe with Japan. I think you observe similar things with Germany. Uh, I feel like I heard that somewhere. I'm not sure if it's in this paper, maybe a different one. It also, by the way, can explain deviations from Zips law and power laws and quasi Zips law that's observed for certain countries, France, Argentina, Russia. In the case of Russia, it's two cities, St. Petersburg and Moscow are much bigger than it's predicted by the power law distribution distribution Mexico with Mexico City. New York State is an example I like. New York City is far bigger than would be predicted by a power law for the state. Most states sort of follow power laws, not New York. Why? Well, obviously, New York City's growth dynamics are very, very different from, you know, Rochester's. Uh, and it's not just random growth, but it's there's some, some persistent permanent difference there. And, and that would be appropriately modeled uh, with a parameter like this. Um, and you know, two minutes left, perfect timing, my last slide. Um, there's some interesting papers coming out. This I have worked on, so I know much more about it. I'd be able to, to better answer questions like the one Bob asked me at the beginning. Um, uh, there's some fascinating studies of, of uh, long-run wealth mobility. In particular, there's this Baron and Mochetti paper. I think it's just came out in the restud or it's going to. And they basically show that you know you they they look at data from the Medici's and, and you know family wealth holdings in Italy, and then they look at it and you know in 1500, then they do it again in like 2010. And what they basically find is that the correlation in ranks across many many generations, you know 600 years almost, is 0.1. Uh, and any any random growth rank based ergodic model Markovian model should give you zero. Right, uh, the, the one generation correlations like 0 0.3, 0 0.35, you take 0.3 to the second, third, fourth power, it quickly goes to zero. Um, so 0.1 
is just wildly inconsistent with essentially 100% of the economics literature on this. Uh, as is this result uh, in this paper using Danish data that if you put parent and grandparent uh, rank, wealth rank on predictive uh, variables and a regression of predicting child wealth rank, both of them are significant. Not just parent rank, obviously that's predictive, not just grandparent rank, but both of them together, which again points to a non-Markovian dynamic. So I have a paper that shows Basically, you can uh, you can not only qualitatively but quantitatively match these things with a simple model that includes uh, basically you know add in this type of parameter with a you know a quantitatively reasonable parameterization of a model like that can match all of these things uh, pretty easily. Uh, so it's evidence of some type of heterogeneity. Now, what that heterogeneity is, we're agnostic about. I don't know. It'd be interesting to look more deeply at it. But it's the, you know the point is that it's behaving differently from what the rank based framework uh, would show. Um, so I'll stop there. I got a minute. Uh, any last questions? But uh, I appreciate all the comments and, and questions, and you know the invite, of course. Thank you. It's great. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Thank you all for the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Going once. Going twice. Well, that, that was really super. So thank you so much. Uh, I have lots of follow-up questions, which I'll, I'll uh, send by email. Yeah, and, sure. No, I, I appreciate the advice. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, and also uh, mention that next week we have a, a kind of a practitioner-oriented discussion of a very related topic, which is indexing, right? Oh, yeah. Which doesn't work quite so um, neutrally, I think, as, as some of the processes you're talking about, there are committees and stuff deciding who's in and who's out, which complicate matters. But uh, we'll be having Vitaly uh, Kolesnik from Research Affiliates talk about the Achilles heel of conventional indexing. So please join us for that. Hope to get, he's, he'll be coming to us from London. So this will be another virtual talk and look forward to seeing many uh, of you then. Um, and remember, thanks again. It was great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye now.